In this section, we're going to consider an application of the Fourier transform for communication systems. In particular, we're going to examine a general technique used in many communication systems known as amplitude modulation. To begin, I'll present the motivation behind amplitude modulation and explain the practical problems that it helps to address. Then I'll introduce two variants of amplitude modulation, known as double sideband suppressed carrier amplitude modulation, and single sideband suppressed carrier amplitude modulation. I'll also present a basic amplitude modulation system and then proceed to use the Fourier transform to characterize the behavior of this system and show that it in fact behaves in the manner expected. In communication systems, the need often arises to transmit a signal using a range of frequencies that differs from the frequency range for which the signal spectrum contains information. Consider audio signals, for example. An audio signal typically has information in the frequency range 0 to 22 kilohertz. As it turns out, it's often not practical to transmit such a signal directly by using frequencies in this range. This situation arises not just for audio signals, but for many other types of signals as well. For this reason, being able to control the range of frequencies used for transmission is highly beneficial. In particular, such control allows a number of important practical issues to be addressed, such as interference between different users of a shared communication channel and constraints on antenna length. First, let's consider the issue of interference. When a communication channel is shared between multiple users, the potential for interference between different users becomes an issue of concern. Consider, for example, the transmission of a signal over the airwaves, as in the case of radio broadcasting. Since many signals are broadcast over the airwaves, we need to ensure that two different transmitters don't use the same range of frequencies for transmission in order to avoid interference. If, for example, two radio stations were to use the same frequency range for their broadcasts, a radio receiver tuned to that frequency range would play the audio for both radio stations simultaneously, which would clearly be undesirable. Next, let's consider the issue of antenna length. Due to the physics of how antennas work, for efficient reception, an antenna needs to have a length comparable to the length of the wave to be received. For this reason, in the case of transmission using electromagnetic waves, the length of antenna required becomes impractically large for the transmission of relatively low frequency signals. This is due to the fact that electromagnetic waves propagate at very high speed, close to the speed of light in most mediums, which implies that low frequency electromagnetic waves will have very large wavelengths. For example, an electromagnetic wave with a frequency of 1 kHz propagating at the speed of light has an approximate wavelength of 300 kilometers, clearly requiring a receiver to have an antenna whose length is on the order of tens or hundreds of kilometers would not be practical. If we had a means to somehow shift the spectrum of a signal to a different frequency range prior to transmission and then undo this shifting effect upon reception, this would allow us to address both of the issues of interference and antenna length. By choosing the frequency range to be used for transmission not to overlap with other users of the same communication channel, interference between different users of the channel can be avoided. Moreover, by using a frequency range for transmission that involves sufficiently high frequencies, electromagnetic waves with extremely large wavelengths can be avoided, eliminating the need for an impractically long antenna. So how might we achieve this goal of shifting the spectrum of a signal to a different frequency range prior to transmission and then undoing the shifting effect upon reception? Well, one way in which we can accomplish this goal is with a technique known as amplitude modulation, which is the main focus of the material that follows. Before introducing any practical scheme for amplitude modulation, I first want to present a very trivial amplitude modulation system. In particular, I'd like to consider the system shown in the figure at the top of this slide. So this system consists of a transmitter, which is the block diagram shown on the left, and a receiver, which is the block diagram shown on the right. And the basic idea is we connect the output of the transmitter to the input of the receiver. So these are effectively connected in series with one another. And if all is good and well in the world, we'd like for the output of the receiver, which is denoted as little x hat, to be equal to the input of the transmitter, which is denoted by little x. If you look at the equation which characterizes the transmitter, 
we have this particular equation here in the time domain. In other words, the output of the transmitter, which is denoted as little y, is equal to the input of the transmitter, which is denoted as little x, times a complex sinusoid with frequency omega c. If we look at the receiver, shown in this block diagram here, it's characterized by this particular equation in the time domain. We have that the output of the receiver, which is denoted by little x hat, is equal to the input of the receiver, which is denoted as little y, times a complex sinusoid with frequency minus omega c. Now if we substitute the formula for little y in this equation for the transmitter into the second equation, the one for the receiver, this gives us the equation shown at the bottom of the slide, in other words this equation here. And we can make the observation that these two complex sinusoidal uh, factors cancel, so we're left with just little x on the right hand side of the equation. So overall what we have is that little x hat, in other words the output of the receiver, is equal to little x, in other words the input to the transmitter. In other words the system behaves in the way that we'd like. The output of the receiver is equal to the input of the transmitter. Of course we can also analyze this system using the Fourier transform. So if we look at the equation that characterizes the transmitter, this equation here, we can take the Fourier transform of this equation by using the modulation property of the Fourier transform and that yields this particular equation here where big X and big Y denote the Fourier transforms of little x and little y respectively. And what this equation tells us is that the spectrum of the output of the transmitter, which is denoted as big Y, is equal to the spectrum of the input to the transmitter, which is denoted as big X, shifted by omega c. If we take the Fourier transform of the equation that characterizes the receiver, so this equation here, and to do this we use the modulation property of the Fourier transform, this yields this particular equation here, where big X hat and big Y denote the Fourier transforms of little x hat and little y respectively. And what this equation tells us is that the spectrum of the output of the receiver, which is denoted as big X hat, is equal to the spectrum of the input of the receiver, which is denoted as big Y, shifted by minus omega c. Because remember, you have to read the shift with a minus sign here, so it's minus minus omega c, so this is a shift by minus omega c. And of course, if we combine these two equations together, in other words, the equation in the Fourier domain for the transmitter and the equation in the Fourier domain for the receiver, because one of these equations involves a shift by plus omega c and the other one involves a shift by minus omega c, the two shifts cancel and what we end up with is no shift at all. And we simply end up with big X is equal to big X hat which is what we would expect based on our analysis of this system in the time domain. Now although the amplitude modulation system shown on this slide works correctly from a theoretical standpoint, it's not useful in practice. If we try to build such a system, we immediately run into a very fundamental practical problem. The problem is that each of the transmitter and receiver require the generation of a complex sinusoidal signal. These are the signals C1 and C2 that appear in the figure at the top of the slide. In the real world, however, we can't physically generate a signal with a non-zero imaginary part. In other words, we're constrained to using real valued signals in the physical systems that we build. Although the trivial amplitude modulation system shown on this slide is not of direct practical use, it does provide some very valuable insight into how we might construct a practically useful system. In particular, we can observe that although we can't physically generate complex sinusoidal signals, we can generate another type of signal that is very closely related to complex sinusoids, namely real sinusoidal signals. Fortunately, we can use this idea in order to develop a practically useful variant of amplitude modulation, as we'll see shortly. On this slide we have an example to illustrate how the trivial amplitude modulation system introduced on the previous slide behaves in terms of frequency spectra. So suppose that the transmitter input has the frequency spectrum shown in the top left. The transmitter then takes this frequency spectrum and shifts it by omega c to yield the spectrum shown in the bottom left. Then the receiver in turn takes this spectrum and shifts it by minus omega c to yield the spectrum shown in the bottom right. And clearly the spectrum of the receiver output is equal to the spectrum of the transmitter input, which is what we desire.
The first variant of amplitude modulation that I'd like to introduce that is of practical interest is known as double sideband suppressed carrier amplitude modulation, which is abbreviated by the acronym DSBSCAM. The system associated with this variant of amplitude modulation is shown in block diagram form at the top of the slide. So in the figure in the top left, we have a block diagram for the transmitter, which has input little x and output little y. And in the top right, we have a block diagram for the receiver, which has the input little y and the output little x hat. So if we look at the transmitter in more detail, the transmitter simply consists of a single multiplier which multiplies by a cosine function with frequency omega c and the receiver consists of a multiplier which multiplies by a cosine function with frequency omega c similar as in the transmitter followed by a linear time invariant filter with impulse response little h where little h is given by this particular formula here. And this particular LTI filter corresponds to a low pass filter with a cutoff frequency of omega c naught combined with an amplifier that amplifies by a factor of 2. In what follows, let big X, big Y, and big X hat denote the Fourier transforms of little x, little y, and little x hat respectively. And suppose that little x is band limited to frequencies in the range minus omega b to plus omega b one can show that the transmitter is characterized in the Fourier domain by an equation of this particular form here. Similarly, one can show in the Fourier domain that the receiver is characterized by an equation of this particular form here. Furthermore, if this particular condition here is satisfied, we can show that big X hat is equal to big X, or equivalently, little x hat is equal to little x. In other words, the output of the receiver, which is denoted by little x hat, is equal to the input to the transmitter, which is denoted as little x. And this is exactly the behavior we would want from a communication system. In other words, we want the output of the receiver to be equal to the input to the transmitter. At this point, I'd like to consider an example in which we'll use the Fourier transform to analyze the amplitude modulation system introduced on this slide, with the objective of showing that the various equations and results stated on this slide are in fact correct. To begin, let's consider the transmitter of the amplitude modulation system. The transmitter is shown in block diagram form at the top of the slide here, where little x denotes the input to the transmitter and little y denotes the output of the transmitter. In other words, the transmitter is characterized in the time domain by this particular equation here that relates little y and little x. What we want to do here is we want to take the Fourier transform of this equation. So in what follows, I'll let big x and big y denote the Fourier transforms of little x and little y respectively. So taking the Fourier transform of this particular equation here, we trivially obtain this line here, where we now need to simplify this particular Fourier transform, the one that's highlighted in green. Now in order to compute this Fourier transform that's highlighted in green, there's two different Fourier transform properties that we could potentially use. One is the multiplication property, the other is the modulation property. And in this particular case, we definitely do not want to use the multiplication property because remember, the multiplication property will drag convolution into the picture. And we really don't want to deal with convolution unless it's absolutely necessary. And in this case, there's no need to drag convolution into the picture because we don't need to use the multiplication property. A much better approach to take is to use the modulation property of the Fourier transform. So what we do is we take this cosine function and we rewrite it as a pair of complex sinusoidal terms using Euler's relationship. So we can rewrite the cosine as this particular pair of complex sinusoidal terms. Then we can use the linearity property of the Fourier transform to interchange the linear combination which appears as the operand for the Fourier transform and the Fourier transform itself. And that gives us this next line here. And at this point, we can use the modulation property of the Fourier transform to compute the two Fourier transforms that appear on this line. 
In other words, this Fourier transform here and this Fourier transform here, both of which involve multiplication by a complex sinusoid. If we consider the first of these Fourier transforms, in other words, this one here, due to this multiplication by a complex sinusoid with frequency omega c, this is going to result in the Fourier transform being shifted by omega c. So that yields this particular expression here. In the case of the second Fourier transform, this one here, we have multiplication by a complex sinusoid with frequency minus omega c. This is going to result in the Fourier transform being shifted by minus omega c, which gives us this particular expression here. So now we've found the equation that characterizes the transmitter in the frequency domain. In particular, we have that big Y, which denotes the spectrum of the output of the transmitter, is given by this right-hand side expression, where big X, which appears in this expression, denotes the spectrum of the input of the transmitter. Next, let's consider the receiver of the amplitude modulation system. The block diagram of the receiver is shown in the figure at the top of this slide where little y denotes the input to the receiver and little x hat denotes the output of the receiver. And the block that's labeled by little h is a linear time invariant filter whose impulse response is given by this particular formula here. Where this corresponds to the impulse response of a low pass filter with a cutoff frequency of omega c naught and a passband gain of 2. So the system that's shown in this block diagram here is characterized by these three equations in the time domain, which are labeled as equations 1, 2, and 3. And essentially what we want to do here is take the Fourier transform of each of these three equations. So in what follows, all that big Y, big V, big H, and big X hat denote the Fourier transforms of little y, little v, little h, and little x hat respectively. Of the equations 1, 2, and 3, I'm first going to take the Fourier transform of equation number 1, in other words, this equation here. So taking the Fourier transform of this equation, we trivially obtain this particular line here, where we now need to simplify the Fourier transform that appears on this line, in other words, the Fourier transform highlighted in green. In order to compute this Fourier transform, there's two different Fourier transform properties that we could potentially use. One is the multiplication property, and the other is the modulation property. In this particular case, we definitely do not want to use the multiplication property, because this property will drag convolution into the picture, and we really don't want to deal with convolution unless it's absolutely necessary. In this case, there's no need to drag convolution into the picture, because we have another way to find the Fourier transform in question. A much better approach is to use the modulation property of the Fourier transform. With this approach, what we can do is take the cosine function here and rewrite this cosine function as a pair of complex sinusoidal terms using Euler's relationship. So we can rewrite the cosine function as this pair of complex sinusoidal terms here. And then we need to simplify this particular Fourier transform. And for this, we can use the linearity property. Essentially, what we have is the Fourier transform of a linear combination which we can rewrite as a linear combination of Fourier transforms, which gives us this next line. And at this point, we can observe that there's two Fourier transforms that we need to deal with, this first Fourier transform here, and this second Fourier transform here. And both of them can be dealt with using the modulation property of the Fourier transform, because both of these Fourier transforms involve multiplication by a complex sinusoid. So if you look at the first Fourier transform, in other words, this one here, here we're multiplying by the complex sinusoid with frequency omega c. So this is going to have the effect of shifting the Fourier transform by omega c, which leads to this particular expression here, where big Y has been shifted by omega c. If we consider the second Fourier transform, in other words this one here, here we're multiplying by a complex sinusoid with frequency minus omega c. So the effect that this will have on the Fourier transform is it will shift it by minus omega c which gives us this expression here, which is big Y shifted by minus omega c. Next, I'm going to take the Fourier transform of equation 2, in other words, this particular equation here. Taking the Fourier transform of this equation, we trivially obtain this line here, 
where we now need to simplify the Fourier transform that appears in this equation. In other words, this Fourier transform here. And we can do this in two steps. First, we can use the linearity property to pull this constant 2 out of the Fourier transform operation. Then what we're left over with is something that we can look up in our Fourier transform table. In particular, we can look up the answer using this Fourier transform pair that's written in the annotation here. So using this Fourier transform pair, we obtain this line here. Lastly, I'm going to take the Fourier transform of equation 3. In other words, this equation here. This can be done using the convolution property of the Fourier transform. What the convolution property says is simply that convolution in the time domain becomes multiplication in the frequency domain. So with that in mind, this convolution of little v with little h becomes the multiplication of big V and big H when the Fourier transform is taken. At this point, we've now derived a set of equations that characterize the receiver in the frequency domain. So far, we've obtained equations characterizing the transmitter and receiver in the frequency domain. Now we're going to combine these results in order to find an equation characterizing the overall system formed by the series interconnection of the transmitter and receiver. In other words, we're considering the overall system formed when the transmitter shown in the figure in the top left is connected in series with the receiver shown in the figure in the top right. To begin, I'd like to recall three equations that were derived earlier when we were examining the transmitter and receiver. Equation 1 was derived earlier when we were looking at the transmitter. The first line of equation 2, which I've highlighted here, was derived earlier when we were looking at the receiver. And the first line of equation 3 was also derived earlier when we were looking at the receiver. Now I'm going to go through a substitution process. I'm going to begin with equation 1, which is essentially an equation for big Y. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute this formula for big Y, given by equation 1, into the right-hand side of equation 2. And then by performing some basic algebraic simplification, I obtain this line here. Then what I'm going to do next is I'm going to take this formula for V of omega, in particular, V of omega given by this right-hand side here, and substitute this in for V of omega in equation 3. And when I do this, this gives me this next line here. And then I can multiply H of omega into each of the terms in square brackets to obtain this next line here. At this point, we can make a few key observations. The first observation is that this particular term here is equal to 0. The reason why is the factor big H of omega and the factor big X of omega minus 2 omega C are never both simultaneously non-zero. Therefore, their product is zero. Similarly, this last term here is also zero. The reason why is the factor big H of omega and the factor big X of omega plus 2 omega C are never both simultaneously non-zero. Therefore, their product is zero. Therefore, the line that we're currently looking at simplifies to this next line here. In other words, only one term is non-zero, which is this first term, which in turn simplifies simply to big X of omega. Thus, the overall system is characterized by the equation big X hat equals big X. In other words, the spectrum of the receiver output is equal to the spectrum of the transmitter input. Thus, we have shown that the amplitude modulation system works as desired. In other words, the receiver output equals the transmitter input. On this slide, we have an example to illustrate how the amplitude modulation system behaves in terms of frequency spectra. Suppose that the transmitter input has the spectrum shown in the top left. Then the transmitter output would have the spectrum shown here. In particular, we have two copies of the original spectrum, one that's been shifted up by omega C, in other words, this copy here, and one that's been shifted down by omega C, in other words, this copy here. And each of these copies has been scaled by a factor of one-half, as can be seen by the vertical scale here. 
Then as an intermediate signal in the receiver, we obtain a signal with this particular spectrum here, where now we have three copies of the original spectrum, one at minus two omega c, this one here, one at the origin, in other words, this one here, and one at two omega c, in other words, this one here. And if we want to get back to the original spectrum in the transmitter input, what we need to do is we need to eliminate this copy of the spectrum at minus two omega c, and this copy of the spectrum at plus two omega c, and in addition, we need to scale this copy of the spectrum by a factor of two, because it's been reduced by a factor of two due to this factor of one half here. So to compensate, we need to scale this by a factor of two to get back to the same scale that we had for the transmitter input spectrum. And we can accomplish this, in other words, accomplish getting rid of this copy of the spectrum here, and this copy over here, and also scaling this middle copy by a factor of two by filtering this signal with a low pass filter with a pass band gain of two and a cutoff frequency of omega c naught where omega c naught is chosen such that omega c naught is greater than omega b and less than two omega c minus omega b in other words this in set of inequalities in green is satisfied as long as this condition is satisfied then this filter will give us the original spectrum at the receiver output. In other words, the original spectrum that was presented to the transmitter as input. In other words, the system will have the overall behavior that we want, that the receiver output will be equal to the transmitter input. At this point, I'd like to briefly comment on another variant of amplitude modulation that's of practical interest, known as single sideband suppressed carrier amplitude modulation, which is abbreviated by the acronym SSBSCAM. The system associated with this variant of amplitude modulation is shown in block diagram form at the top of this slide. I'm not going to go through this variant of amplitude modulation in any significant detail. Instead, I'm just going to comment on its main benefit relative to double sideband suppressed carrier amplitude modulation that was discussed earlier. Namely, the bandwidth of the communication channel required by single sideband suppressed carrier amplitude modulation is half of that required by double sideband suppressed carrier amplitude modulation. This difference between these two amplitude modulation variants is worth noting since communication systems that require less bandwidth have many advantages. On this slide, we have an example to illustrate how the single sideband suppressed carrier amplitude modulation system behaves in terms of frequency spectra. Suppose that the transmitter input has the spectrum shown in the top left figure here. In the case of a double sideband type system, the spectrum that would be broadcast would look something like what's shown in this figure here. In the case of a single sideband system, however, the spectrum that would actually be broadcast would look something like what's shown in this figure here. And you can see that this spectrum has half the bandwidth of the spectrum above it. In particular, what's happened is that half of this copy of the original spectrum has been eliminated to produce this spectral content here. And then half of this copy of the original spectrum has been eliminated to produce this spectral content here. So as you can see, a single sideband type system requires half the bandwidth of a double sideband type system. And this can be advantageous for a number of reasons.